hard to, to whisper to someone when, you've, when you're wearing a mic. <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. There we go. How's everybody doing? <laughs> we'll work on that. I want to show you, you folks some stuff. I, uh, I, I worked on a library recently, started working on a library recently called Knot. It's a, it's a toolkit for generating null object classes. And today I, I want to show you uh, just some of the fun parts of building this library. So uh, just to get things started, who here does not know what the null object pattern is? Couple of hands. So, so for the people that, that don't know or uh, are a little bit unclear on it, here's uh, the quickest possible uh, explanation of the null object pattern. Here's a method. It's a chatty method. It does a lot of logging. And it's got this logger argument. And before it uses the logger, every time it wants to use the logger, it has to first check to see if the logger is there. So it's doing all these and ands. Here is an application of the null object pattern to a logger interface. This is a class which implements a logger. Uh, well, it implements all of the methods that you would normally expect to find on a logger, but they all do nothing. They just throw their input away. We can use this, we can take this, and we can apply it to that method that we saw. We can replace the nil with a null logger default. And now all those and ands go away because we don't have to check to see if the logger is there anymore. Because even if no logger is supplied, it's going to have a null one and it's going to accept all those calls. It's not going to blow up. It's not going to do anything, but it's not going to blow up. So at its core, null object is, is a way to kind of clean up code. Now obviously, as you've just seen, it does not take a null object class to, uh, or it doesn't, it doesn't take a library to generate a null object it's pretty easy to write one yourself. So why would I write a library for building one? Well, um, one reason was just to, uh, to make easy things even easier. So this code here shows how you would use not to generate that exact same null object. Uh, we, we say uh, not.build, and then inside there we say config.mimic, and give it a class that we want to mimic. And now it's going to define all those methods uh, to do nothing, to just return nil, all the, the methods that it finds on that class. So it makes that a little bit easier. There are, it all, there are also, it turns out, a bunch of different little variations on the null object pattern. And I kind of wanted to give people a way to play with some of these different variations. So um, this first example is an example of a, uh, what some have called a black hole null object. Black hole uh, returns, rather than returning nil, it returns itself from every call. And this is useful for chaining operations. For instance, the shovel operator, we can chain a bunch of shovels together, and it's going to return the same null object from each invocation, so then you can then chain another one on the end. <clears throat> another variation that's kind of interesting is the idea of a traceable null object. You can see this in the bottom example. Traceable is a null object which knows what file and line it was instantiated on. And this is handy for, um, for the case where you're trying to figure out where a null came from. You're doing a little debugging, and you're trying to figure out why you've got a null instead of a real object. Now, I'd like to tell you that I developed this library, like extracted it out of some application where I needed to use a lot of null objects. But uh, that wouldn't be true. That, that is not the case. Uh, the truth is, I just really love metaprogramming. I think it's fun. I get a kick out of it. Uh, different, people, different people do different kinds of programming for fun. Katrina Owen talks about therapeutic refactoring, where you refactor just for the sheer pleasure of it. Some folks do code golf, where you try to make this, take the smallest amount of code to accomplish something. So here is a functional to-do list in 140 characters. I met a program for fun. I got a kick out of it. And if you're going to metaprogram for fun, Ruby is a pretty cool language to do it in. 
Of course, it's not the only language that you can use for metaprogramming. Lots of languages let you do metaprogramming. In C and C++, we did metaprogramming with preprocessor macros or templates. Uh, C Sharp and Java, you can do all kinds of class generation at runtime. You have these class elaborate class reflection APIs. And then, of course, in Lisp, Lisp is renowned for its metaprogramming abilities because you've, everything is an S expression, and then you can write these macros that operate on S expressions. But um, there's kind of a common theme to all of these, to the metaprogramming uh, that you see in all these, which is that there are kind of two levels. You've got the, metapro the programming level, um, and, then you, uh, and then you've got the metaprogramming level. And you, either you're programming or... Uh, or your metaprogramming. In Ruby, it's a little different. So in Ruby, we can take an array, and we can ask it what size it is. That's programming. We can ask it for its list of methods. That's, that's uh, not telling it to do something, but it's, it's, it's saying, tell me what I can tell you to do. That's metaprogramming. It's simple metaprogramming, but it's metaprogramming. It's invoking reflection, the ability for a, an object in the language to tell you about itself. And, uh, and then we can take that list of methods, and we can ask it for its size. So that's back to programming, like in the first line. So in, in Ruby, instead of these different levels, um, these different worlds of programming and metaprogramming, it's all, it's all mixed up. It's all kind of intertwingled together. And I think that's, that's something, that's part of what makes metaprogramming so appealing in Ruby. Uh, I've realized that Ruby is kind of a punk rock metaprogramming language. When Ruby wants to sew a new patch on its genes, it just sits right down and sews the patch on right there. And sometimes it sews the patch onto its leg in the process, but, you know, these things happen. Anyway, back to the code. So... This is a toolkit for generating null object classes, which means that kind of at its core is this idea of generating a new class. When we use the library, we, uh, we call not.build, and then we assign the result to a constant because the result is a newly generated class. So how do we generate classes in Ruby? Well, when we, when we want to generate a new object in Ruby, we send the new message to the object class. When we want to generate a new class in Ruby, we send the new method to the class class. And I love the parity here. It's, a, it's the same thing. It's, it's very predictable. If we want, we can specify what the base class will be by passing in a new, uh, passing in what the base class to that new call. And uh, now, when that class is first generated, it's kind of ugly. It doesn't have a name. It just has an ID. That's all it knows. But the first time we assign it to a constant, it takes on the name of that constant. And forever after that, it knows its own name. And this is a little surprising when you first see it, but it's very, very convenient. All right, so that's generating a class. How do we generate a null class? Well, we start out with that class.new, and we'll base it on a basic object to base it on something that has very few methods of its own. Now, it seems like a good default implementation of a null class would be that all of its instances will respond to any method uh, and, and just return nil. So how do we make that happen? Well, it turns out to be incredibly simple. We do take our class.new, and then inside the block that we pass to that, we define two methods. We define method missing, and uh, we give it the, just the star as its arguments. If you haven't seen this before, that just means take any arguments and ignore them all. Uh, some have called this the naked splat. And, it's, and we don't even need to put anything in that method because by default Ruby returns nil from empty methods. So that's done. The only other thing we need to do is, since this responds to any method, uh, any message, we should, we should say that we respond to any message, so we define respond to as well, and we just return true from, for that. Piece of cake. Very simple. This kind of coding makes me happy. It brings me joy. I've been thinking about the things that bring me joy, the things that make me happy. And uh, one of the things that has consistently brought me joy throughout my life is music. Has anybody seen the movie Garden State? A few people. Um, 
this movie, um, it's one of my favorite movies, and it, it, there's this scene in it which has always stuck with me. Towards the beginning of the movie, uh, Zach Braff's character and Natalie Portman's character, they meet in a doctor's office waiting room, and Portman is listening to, uh, she's listening to music on this great big pair of headphones. And, and she says to Braff, you got to hear this one song. It'll change your life. And this statement, this scene sticks with me because this statement really sums up how I've felt about a lot of great pieces of music in my life. And this got me to thinking, well, okay, has, has code ever brought me that level of joy? Can code change your life? But I realize Ruby has changed my life. I used to work at a great big faceless company. I wrote a lot of C++, uh, even some Visual Basic. I filled out a lot of TPS reports. And then I, then I learned Ruby, and, and it was fun. It made me happier, but there was more to it than that. I got involved in the Ruby community, and I met people that were organizing meetups for fun. They were organizing conferences for fun, just to get together and talk about code. They were optimizing their lives for happiness. In some cases, that meant optimizing their jobs for happiness. And that, has, that process has led me on a long trip to this point where I am a much, much happier hacker today because of Ruby. Anyway, back to the code. So, up till now, we've been building these, these null classes to always be based on the basic object class. But um, I wanted to provide the ability to vary the base class. Maybe we want to base it on object instead of basic object. One reason I wanted to be able to do this is that I wanted to support a feature call, I call impersonation. There are some, some code bases where the code already has a lot of explicit type checks, where it's looking for a particular type. And if you're going to, to introduce a null object to one of those code bases, it may be that the only way for your null object to pass as one of the objects that that code is expecting, that it's doing explicit type checks for, is for it to actually be a subtype of that type of object, to actually inherit from that type of object, and then and then override all those methods uh, to, be, to be null. So I wanted the ability to replace the, uh, to set a different null class, uh, a different base class for these null object classes. But this introduced a problem. Because up till now, we've been instan I'd been instantiating a base, a, a, not a null object class, and then I'd been doing these operations on it, you know, config.mimic or config.whatever. And those operations were operations on that generated class. You know, they would stub out met new methods or something like that. But if I'm not even going to know what the base class is until somewhere down inside that config block, inside that build block, well, how can I, I can't have a class without having a, knowing the base class yet. How can I have the class, how can I operate on the class when I don't know what the class is going to be yet? So I've got kind of a chicken and egg scenario. And I realized that what I was going to have to do is I was going to have to start queuing up deferred operations. I was going to have to start uh, queuing these, uh, these things that I perform on the class that's being built and deferring them until later. So I started by creating a queue of operations, which could just be an array. And then I arranged so that after, once the class was known, once the, the base class was known and the class being generated was, was created, then I would loop through and invoke all those deferred operations by calling dot .call on them. Finally, I, I created a little helper method that would help me turn an operation into a deferred operation. It takes a block, it converts that block, block into a proc, and then adds it to that deferred operations queue. So earlier we saw mimic, right? Mimic is this idea that you can tell it to mimic a particular class 
and it'll stub out all the methods that are defined on that class. Here's the implementation of Mimic before I introduced deferred operations. And pretty, it's pretty straightforward, really. It just, you, you've got a module eval inside the subject, which is the class being built, and then it just goes through, it takes the class to Mimic, asks it for its instance methods, then goes through that list of instance methods and stubs out each one on the class that's being built. Here's what the code looked like after I switched to deferred operations. And really the only functional difference here is that I added a defer block around part of the code. I said, this part of the code, defer it to later. That's it, that's the, all, the, all it took to change, to change this to deferring operations to later. I love this, it's clean, it adapts the language to say exactly what I want it to say. I can just say, this block of code, defer it. And it's, it's won me a major change in behavior for a relatively minor change in the code. I want to go back to Garden State for a minute. One of the, reason, the reasons the scene sticks with me so much um, is that I think it says something really profound about joy. Because in it you see, you see Portman's character compelled, she, she loves this piece of music so much that she feels compelled to share it with a stranger in a waiting room. And I think this says something really profound and true about the practice of joy. I think that, that joy is completed. It is, it is brought to its full fruition when we share it with someone else. This is why I'm sharing this code with you today. One of the best ways that we have as, as programmers of, share, of sharing our coding joy with each other is through pair programming. When two programmers sit down at a desk together and they, they work on the same piece of code together. I've been doing pair programming uh, in some form or another for many years, but f for a good chunk of last year, I did nothing but pair programming. I became uh, a consulting pair programmer and I took appointments with people who would pair with me for two hours at a time. And I paired with dozens and dozens of people from all over the world, all different skill levels as a result of this, this uh, project. And this process brought me immeasurable amounts of joy. I've been trying since then to, to share this experience with other people. I've been trying to encourage other people to have this kind of experience and one of the things I've been doing is I've been kind of campaigning to get people to do stuff like put this this button on their this uh, badge on their websites to let the world know kind of put a welcome mat out to say yes I am open to to pairing sessions to um, I should say remote pairing sessions because all of these sessions that I did they were all remote I've also been asking people to, to tweet on Twitter with the the pair with me hashtag, uh, and I'll retweet that when I, whenever I see it, and uh, and and people get hooked up, you know, uh, to do these ad hoc pairing sessions. I've also, with the help of the community, have been putting together a website that just lists resources for finding people to remote pair with and for uh, the technology to do this kind of pairing. Oh my! <laughs> Wake up, everyone! <laughs> And you don't, have to, you don't have to take my word for how amazing this experience is. Here are just a few things that, that people have said about the, uh, the Pair With Me project. Somebody said, uh, being re-energized in my quest to be a Ruby developer. I might be hooked on remote pairing. This Pair With Me thing is really deepening the sense of community, I feel. How cool is that? And the great thing is there are no excuses left. We live in an age where if you have, even if you're a solo developer, even if you're out in the middle of nowhere, 
If you have an internet connection in a computer, you can have a pair programming session with somebody out there, and I promise you there's somebody out there who'd like to do it. Anyway, back to the code. Interface subsetting. There's a big word. Sounds fancy. So you remember that mimic method? We already talked about it. Give it a, give it a class, it'll, it'll give you a null object that mimics all those methods. Well, it mimics, we want it to mimic most of the methods on the class that we give it. We want it to mimic all of the, the uh, sort of class specific methods, but we probably don't actually want that to mimic like basic core Ruby stuff like object ID. It should leave methods like object ID alone. So how do we do that? How do we get it? How do we just, you know, winnow down the list of methods to just the ones that, uh, that are specific to that class. Well, here's one thing we might think of. We might think to use instance methods with the false argument, which you might know, some of you might know that if you pass false to instance methods, you get a list of instance methods that are just defined on that class, not on any of its superclasses. But this breaks down pretty quickly, because supposing we have something like a mylogger class, which inherits from logger, and it adds one method. I think when we when we mimic that, we probably want to get all of the methods defined on logger and on mylogger, not just the one method that's, that's defined on mylogger and, and, and fail to mimic any of the others. So that doesn't work. All right, so what are we going to do? Well, here's the building blocks that we're going to use to solve this problem. First of all, you can send the instance methods message to a class, and it'll give, return an array of symbols representing all of the methods that that class can, that class can respond to. Second, the fact that in Ruby, arrays have set operations defined on them. So you can do set union, you can do set intersection, and you can subtract one set from another. You can see uh, the difference between two sets using the subtraction operator. So to get our interface subset, all we need to do is take those instance methods on the class to mimic, then find all the instance methods on object, those core methods that we don't want to touch, subtract the, li the list of the methods on object from the list of methods on the class to mimic, and then just go through the, the resulting list and one by one stub each of them out. So interface subsetting turns out not to be as difficult or as fancy as, as uh, intimidating as it sounded. It's actually very simple. But make no mistake, this is a pretty advanced operation. It's just really, really easy when we put together the building blocks that Ruby gives us. I want to talk about pairing a little bit more. So I've been kind of uh, banging on this pairing drum for a while this year. And as a result, one of the things, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people about pairing. And, and one of the, the concerns that they share with me something that I hear a lot is, you know, this from folks that consider themselves newbies, they say, you know, who would want to pair with me? I'm no expert. So to kind of answer this question, I, I, I asked around recently for people to tell me, what was your late last Ruby wow moment? Like just something that, that you know, you saw and just blew your mind. And... I got a lot of responses, and of course I got, you know, a few responses that left even me scratching my head. If anybody understands that, come to me and explain it to me later. Uh, but I also got responses like this. A few people said this. Being able to reopen an object or class. That was, that was, was somebody's Ruby wow moment. Now, how many of you know that you could do this and could explain it to somebody else? There you go. You've got everything you need to blow someone's mind. Okay, but maybe you're thinking, I'm a, you know, maybe I'm, you're a, a total newbie to Ruby. Maybe you're a newbie to programming. And you're thinking, I bring, I bring nothing to the table. Why would somebody want to pair with me? Well, I, I have an answer to that. Um, I'm going to answer it in kind of a roundabout way, though. I have kids. Um, who here has kids? A decent number of people have kids. If you have kids, 
you know that you get to you get to rediscover the world through their eyes. And um, th this is a here's a picture of two of my children discovering track maintenance equipment. Now, if you don't have kids, you may not realize that by combining construction equipment and a train, track maintenance equipment is the most mind-blowing thing in the world. And I get to share this experience with them. I get to live this, this wow moment with them. I want to go back to the scene in Garden State one, one more time because in this scene between Portman's character and Brav's character, who do you think has the better deal here? My money is on Portman because sure, Zach Braff is letting, getting to listen to the shins, but Portman is having the experience of sharing something that, of, of watching somebody experience something that she loves watching them experience that for the very first time. And that is a precious experience, watching somebody, you know, come to that, that amazing song or that amazing movie or that amazing piece of code for the very first time. And when, I've been, when I've paired with newbies, I've been able to experience those wow moments time and time again. And it goes beyond that. I, I've learned more about what I knew that I didn't realize that I knew until I had a reason to enunciate it. I learned a lot about what I don't know and what I could really use to go and, and, and brush up on. I spent a lot of time in these pairing sessions saying, I don't know, but I can find out. And, and this is really important. I learned a lot about how to put the ideas in my head into words because I had to explain them. I had to explain my thinking for the very first time. These are all really, really important things that I got out of these pairing sessions. So uh, if you're a beginner and you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope it's that you take this away. When you bring your beginner's mind to the pair programming table, you're giving your partner a profound gift. I also hear a lot from people who feel, they feel intimidated um, if, they, if they perceive that the person that they're going to be pair programming with is, you know, a pro, is somebody who's really experienced, a guru. They feel really intimidated by that. Um, I have a story about this. Actually, it's not my story. Um, Steve Klabnik tells a story. I can tell this because he's not here, so I'm going to steal his story. Um, he tells a story about a pairing session that he had. And he was pairing, I think, with a, a relative beginner to Ruby, and, or maybe intermediate. And they were working on a problem, and they, they hit a wall with this problem. And they just, they just could not figure out a way around it. There was a, some bug, some problem they could not solve. And they spent like 45 minutes of the session just beating their heads against this wall. And finally, at the end of this process, the, the, the newbie programmer says to Steve, man, I, I'm so sorry about this. I, this is, I'm sorry about, you know, this pairing session must have been so boring for you. This must have been, a, you know, a total waste of time. And Steve says, dude, what do you think I do all day? This is programming. This is what we do. This is what we all do. We solve problems and sometimes we spend 45 minutes or an hour or two hours or a whole day beating our head against one stupid problem. Anyway, back to the code. All right, so as you've, you, you've seen a few of these operations that, that can be performed within a build block on these null class objects, uh, like the, the mimic and the impersonate, traceable, and all these are, there are all these different operations that can be performed on the class that's being built. And I, was, I put them all in this class called null class builder. 
And as I kept adding to it, it kept getting bigger and bigger, and eventually it got to like over, over 200 lines of code, which for me is, is a signal that it's really time to start refactoring stuff out of there. It's getting a little too big. So I decided to go with one of the classic refactorings. I would start sprouting off command objects. Uh, so I would have, I had like a, a command base class, and I would, inside a commands namespace, I would create a new class to represent the operation. So in this case, so here's a class to represent the mimic operation that it was just a method inside that, that uh, builder class. And then in, back in the builder class, I would replace all the lines of code in that mimic method, which is the one line that instantiates an instance of the mimic command and then executes it. And this is cool, this is cool. This, you know, let me move a lot of stuff out. But it's still left, it's left this stub behind, this stub one line method behind. And I still had to, you know, add a new, a new method like this. Every time I added a new command, I still had to, you know, put this another stub method back in the null class builder. And I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to know if I could do one better. I wanted to see if I could make things, uh, like, just reduce the code even more. I wanted to know if I could just have the commands be dynamically discovered. So first of all, I wrote a, a, just a little text munging method to co convert uh, command names from, to get derive command names, class names from method names. It's basically just, just snake case to camel case. And I wrote a method missing on the null class builder, which would take a command which would you know, take a, a method that wasn't recognized and check to see if there was a command object, a command class, that corresponded to that method. And if so, it would instantiate the class, it would pass in the arguments, and it would, it would invoke it. And of course, since I'm a polite metaprogrammer, I also define respond to missing, so they would report that it actually responds to all those, those methods that have corresponding command classes. So now, when I have a, one of these build blocks, and there are all these operations that are going on within the build block, some of those operations could be, could be defined in that null class builder class. Some of the other ones might just be command classes inside that commands namespace. But it, the, the difference is totally transparent to the user. So this is pretty cool. But it gets better because it's all dynamically discovered, because it's just looking in that commands namespace, namespace when I, in this case, when I say namespace, I just mean a module. It's looking in that commands module to find these. That means anybody can create their own command class, and as long as they commit, create it within that commands namespace, it'll be discovered for the, by this. So in effect, I've given myself plugins for free. How cool is that? So obviously, metaprogramming is awesome. When, when I sit down to program, I write code to solve a problem. When I sit down to metaprogram, I write code that writes code to solve a problem. And this gives me a ton of leverage. When I sit down alone at my desk to program. I might learn a little bit about the problem that I'm working on. I might learn a little bit about the tool that I'm using to solve it. When I sit down with somebody else, either at a desk or virtually, to program together, I learn new ways to think about the problem, new perspectives on the problem. I learn new approaches. I learn, I, I see things that I didn't realize about my, how I've been addressing problems all this time by, by looking at how they're different. Sometimes I find out the problem isn't a problem at all, and I save a lot of time. When I pair a program with many different people, I find that it sparks new ideas in my head at an amazing pace. And it reignites the passion that I feel for programming. So 
pair programming, it's, it's kind of like metaprogrammering. And yes, I just made up that word. If, if, Rich Hickey can, if Rich Hickey can do it, I can do it too. One of the, the phrases that you might hear in a paraprogramming session is something along the lines of, you gotta try this. You gotta try this one thing. And this phrase sums up for me at what makes this a joyous profession that we're in. It's that, that glorious hack, that tidbit of new information that just makes you want to say, come here, come here, come here. You got to try this. You got to check this out. I want to encourage you today to pursue those things that make you feel that way. Pursue those things that make you want to share, that make you want to say, come here, you got to try this. Make time in your weeks to work on, on the kind of coding that makes you feel that way, whether it's metaprogramming, whether it's refactoring, whether it's code golfing, whether it's functional programming, whatever it is. Make sure that you're taking some time every week to do that kind of coding that just brings you joy, that just makes you happy, that makes you want to share. This stuff is important. I think that, it, that doing this stuff, it makes us better programmers. The organizers of this conference have put together a fantastic program for you. And I think you're going to be seeing people through the next two days who are all doing their own version of, come here, you got to try this. They're all showing you those things that they love so much, they just have to share them with you. As you go through the next couple of days, and as you, um, as you see these talks, I hope that you will think about what are those things that make you feel that way? What are those things that make you say, you got to try this? that make you want to share. And, and maybe, maybe when you go out into the hallway to have conversations, maybe get out your laptop and show someone something that just excites you. Just the cool hack that you did the other day. The technology that you just learned. Whatever it is. I hope that you will, you will show someone else something that just brings you joy. And by showing them, complete your own joy. Show me. I love seeing the things that, that get people excited. Show me the cool stuff that, that, that you've been doing. Now listen, I hate to, to, uh, to kick off a conference with some bad news, but I do have a little bit of bad, bad news for you. As impossible as it may seem, this conference will come to a close. Now, when, you, when it does happen, and when you go home, I'm confident that you're going to go home energized and excited, and you're going to be ready to try new things. But I have a little bit more bad news. That feeling is going to fade. It's inevitable. And you might not be going to another conference like this for another six months or another year. I know a way to restore that feeling. I know a way to restore that feeling of excitement, that energy, week after week after week. And I know because over and over, last year, I looked at my schedule late in the day and I thought, oh, I've got another pair programming, pair programming appointment before I'm done. I'm so tired. I just want to watch TV. But I fired up my screen share and I fired up Skype. And I had that pair programming session with somebody I'd never met before, never coded with before. 
And every single time, by the middle of that programming session, I was, I was excited, I was energized, I was having new ideas, I was jotting down thoughts for the next episode of Ruby Tapas. Every time. This is an amazing way to restore that passion and that energy. And if you're looking for a way to, to ways to, to get into this, I, I do suggest you check out the pair program with me site. Uh, there are a bunch of resources there for, uh, for getting hooked up with people and for the technology. Also, uh, I passed a hat around. Hopefully it's, it's made, made it through the whole room. I passed a hat around earlier with some little cards in it with some codes on them that you can, you can go to the URL on that card, you can type in your code, and it'll match you up with another programmer. It might be somebody from this conference, it might be somebody from one of the last few conferences that I went to and distributed cards at. Now, it's totally up to you. You don't have to do this. Um, just know that every card has a pair, and has one pair, and so if you don't go online and put your, punch your code in, then somebody out there is gonna be sad and lonely. <laughs> so no pressure. Bottom line is this, I want to encourage you to go out there and share your coding joy with somebody else. You never know, it might just change their, change their life. Thank you very much, happy hacking everyone, and enjoy this conference. <laughs>